Network. Okay, so this video is on genetic inheritance. Um, I'm using PowerPoints from a book by Wendy Roscoe uh, called Human Biology and Anatomy and Physiology for the Health Sciences. Um, I know it's not your book, but it is um, a very good slide presentation on this particular topic, and so um, it's succinct and to the point. So really, genetics is about genes and how genes influence traits. And genes are really the collection of triplets in the DNA that code for a specific protein. Um, so it is, so one gene is the instructions to make a protein and all of the triplets on the DNA for that. And as you remember from protein synthesis uh, discussions, that the protein synthesis revolves around uh, transcribing the DNA, the genotype, so the instructions from a gene, onto messenger RNA into the triplets, which is then translated into becoming a protein. And the protein that is made <clears throat> represents the phenotype or the physical uh, properties. So the genotype includes all the genes that we have. The phenotype is the genes that are actually expressed as proteins. And so these genes are actually found on the chromosomes. And so, um, so, and the chromatids. So in a simple chromosome, so during, uh, during the G1 part of interphase, the chromatin is, is singular and it's like this and the genes are, are there and they may be linked onto the same chromosome. They might be in different parts. During S, it is duplicated and you have the chromatids and the genes are here. And as you remember, each chromosome is in a pair. Um, so there are 23 pairs of chromosomes, each of them with the genes in the corresponding places on each side of the pair. So heredity is the transfer of traits from one parent to another. If the trait is heritable, it is called a phenotype. So examples of this would be things like hair color, eye color, uh, things that you directly inherit from your parents. So when we look at the genetic makeup, the, the, the really it's the karyotype of the, of humans, Karyotype is really the number of um, of chromosomes that we have. So in humans, we have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, so two copies of every gene, and these copies, each copy is called an allele. Our karyotype, therefore, is is 46 chromosomes. The other great apes have 48 chromosomes. Dogs have 78, so they're karyotyped to 78. Fruit flies have two, uh, or two pairs. They have four chromosomes, so their karyotype is four chromosomes. So when we look at the alleles, the, the copies of each gene, uh, that they make up our genotype. Our phenotype is how we express. So we might have the the genotype that codes for blue eyes and on the other allele the gene that codes for brown eyes. Our genotype would therefore be heterozygous, one of each, but our phenotype would be brown eyes because brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes. So the guy who figured out a lot of this was an old monk who was uh, interested in gardening and growing food. And he started noticing all kinds of things about peas. And he was 
meticulous and he wrote things down. He was a very early scientist uh, a couple hundred years ago. So he noticed that there were different phenotypes, that some pea plants had purple flowers and some had white flowers. Some peas were yellow and some peas were green. Some peas were wrinkled, some peas were, were not wrinkled. Some, the plants grew tall and narrow and the other ones, they were short and kind of squat plants. And he realized that there were all these different phenotypes and that it wasn't just random. So he worked out how it worked. So he started realizing that there was the round, yellow, that the pods were either inflated or dimpled, that the pods could be yellow or green, the flowers could be purple or white, uh, that some of the flowers were uh, axial and some of them were terminal, like so that means that axial means the flower grows off and the stem continues, terminal means that they're at the end of the stems. So these things were all traits that he noticed were reproducible. And he started counting them and that kind of thing. And then he started making crosses. So he would cross a round seed with a wrinkled seed and uh, the first generation of the, that offspring were all round seeds. And then the second generation, so if he crossed these first generation ones, that he ended up with, with three times as many um, round seeds as wrinkly seeds ones. So that basically wrinkly seeds would skip a generation and become about one quarter of the F2 generation. When he saw the yellow, he crossed the yellow and green. In the first generation, all yellow. In the second generation, about a three to one. So 25% would be green, where two thirds or three quarters would be yellow inflated, so an inflated and constricted, all would be inflated. Then the next generation, about three times as many inflated as constricted. When he looked at pod color, all green, when you cross green and yellow, in the next generation, about three times as many, so uh, about one quarter would be yellow. The same happened with purple, the same happened. And so he started seeing these traits that in the F1 generation, everything was the same. But in the F2 generation, things would be, would vary. So yeah, so, so Mendel saw this. And so what he, he had was true breeding plants. So, so through generation after generation, he had true breeding yellow seeds true beating green seed, you know, et cetera. Uh, so he knew that they would always give that. And when he crossed the true breeding yellow with the true breeding green, he ended up with the F1 generation, the first generation, all being the one dominant trait. And then 25% uh, of, the of the recessive trait uh, in the next generation. And he saw this pattern over and over again and over thousands and thousands of plants. Um, so we now know that if it's a true breeding thing, then it is, uh, that it's called homozygous, which means that both alleles are the same and it doesn't matter which allele is passed on. When the alleles are different, which they will be in that F1 generation, they are called heterozygous. So uh, he always found that the trait disappeared in the F1 generation, reappeared in the F2. So the F1 trait 
is the dominant trait, and the F, the one that didn't get expressed, but would appear one generation later, was the F two or is was is the recessive trait. And like I said, three quarters of the F two are the dominant, one quarter the recessive. And over large numbers, it ended up being, you know, closer and closer and closer to the ratio of three to one. So for instance, three to one, purple flowers to white flowers. So the genotype of that ratio though, wasn't three, but actually one, two, one. So one would be a homozygous dominant, two would be heterozygous with the dominant trait being the phenotype, and one would be homozygous recessive, so the phenotype would, would be the recessive. And this is just showing that. So this here is called a Punnett square. And you can see that you have pure breeding purple, pure breeding white. The gametes, so the pollen or the, come from each. You get all of the F1 generation being heterozygous. So this is large P for purple, small P for white. All of the pollen from the white flowers would be small p. All from the purple would be. Right? So you cross these, and all of the offspring would be large p, small p. They would be heterozygous. So homozygous, homozygous, all of them heterozygous. You cross two heterozygous, so large p, small p, large p, small p. And what you end up with is one large P, large P, purple, one large P, small P, purple, one small P, large P, purple, and one small P, small P. And so a white flower. So the genotypes are P, P, purple, large P, small P, purple, small P, small P, white. So, now this is not an exact thing, it's probability. Now, um, one of the things to think about in probabilities, and what kind of throws us sometimes, so if you're going to flip a coin, you could land heads or tails. I know it could land on the edge, we won't. 50% heads, 50% tails. If we flip the coin twice, there's four outcomes. Two heads, a head, then a tail, a tail, then a head, or two tails. So there's four possible outcomes. A lot of people think there's three outcomes because a head and a tail appears twice, but which one comes first? Right. So that's, and this is just looking at that. So you basically have 0.5 for here and 0.5 to there, which is a 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So you've got a quarter of a chance that it's going to be this, you know, et cetera. So, in the Punnett squares, you put the possible gametes from the, the male and the possible gametes from the female on either side of the square. And that gives you a square of four possibilities. Uh, and we look at it, so the simplest way of looking at it is these monohybrid crosses, just looking at one trait, right? So, so if, 
so here's some questions. If two pea plants are heterozygous for a flower color, what color will they be? They'll be the dominant color, purple. What are the possible gametes they could form? So the gamete is the pollen cell or the, the, this protoseed cell. So, uh, the, so these are the haploid cells. The gametes are the, are the sex cells, as it were. You could have a, a dominant gamete or you could have a recessive gamete. And you're going to have one of each if they're heterozygous. What's the possible offspring they could produce? Well, if you put the two of them together, you're going to have two dominants, a dominant, a recessive, a recessive and a dominant, and two recessives. Again, there's the pundit square. Here's some interesting dominant and recessive traits that we have in humans that are documented. I'm going to go through them because it's really kind of cool. The shape of a face, oval versus a square jaw. Recessive is the square jaw. No cleft in your chin versus a cleft in your chin. Recessive is a cleft in your chin. So that means if you have a chin cleft, you're, you're a homozygous recessive for that trait. Hairline, whether there's a widow peak, that's the dominant, versus a straight hairline. Homozygous recessive straight. Eyebrow size, slender would be uh, the recessive. A unibrow, separated is the dominant, the recessive is, is a unibrow. Long eyelashes are dominant over short, Free earlobes versus ones that are attached that don't hang free. Freckles are dominant over no freckles. Whether you can roll your tongue, like make the hot dog roll. Whether when you stick your thumb up to hitchhike, it goes straight up or whether it bends backwards. Little fingers bent versus straight. This one is really cool. And it's amazing that it it is um, that it is a genetic thing. Interlock your fingers and then look at your thumbs where they come together. If your left thumb goes over the right thumb, that's the dominant trait. If your right thumb is over the left thumb, it's the non-dominant trait. So do that and then go the other way and see how uncomfortable it is. It's really weird. Um, so if you're a square face, cleft chin, straight hairline, slender eyebrow, unibrowed, short eyelashed, attached ear lobe, non-freckled, hitchhiker thumb, bent straight little finger with your left thumb over. You have a lot of recessive traits. So how do we know what what you what you have? We can't really look at it, especially in the eighteen hundreds. So we he developed these tests called the test cross to determine the genotype of unknown individuals because you know their phenotype so the phenotype is purple flowers so if you test cross it with uh, a white flowered plant you know that the white flower plant has to be homozygous recessive because that's the only way that white flowers can exist to be homozygous recessive. The purple flowers could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So, so if the unknown one is crossed with the homozygous recessive, so if the purple is crossed with the white, uh, if the homozygous is, or if the unknown, so if the one you're testing is homozygous dominant, then all of the offspring will be dominant. It will be like an F1 cross. If the unknown is heterozygous, that means that half of its offspring will have the recessive trait and cross with the, like half of its gametes, cross with the recessive trait from the homozygous recessive and 
will show the recessive trait and the other half will show the dominant trait because they will be a, the offspring will be heterozygous so you make the cross if you get all dominant the individual that you're crossing is homozygous dominant if you make the cross and you get half and half it is um, the unknown that you're testing is a heterozygous so here's here's this so this is the heterozygous large p small p small p small p you cross them you get half large p large small p and half small p small p if you do the same thing with a true breeding purple you're going to get them all heterozygous offspring so the alleles of a trait separate from each other when the gametes are formed so half of them carry one copy the other half carries the other because the germ cells are diploid that have so in humans there are 46 chromosomes 23 pairs the haploid has 23 chromosomes one of each pair the second law says that there's an independent assortment that how each chromosome ends up in a gamete is um, random so if we have 23 pairs and so say you get pair you get chromosome 1b and then you could get 2a and 3a and then the next gamete could be 1b 2b 3a you know etc that you end up with two billion different combinations of gametes uh, so no two of your kids will ever be exactly the same unless they're identical twins so we're going to look at something called a dihybrid cross this makes it slightly more complicated so if round and yellow are dominant over wrinkled and green the genotype so you're going to take a round yellow p and cross it with a wrinkled green p you're going to end up with uh, with this so the gametes would be big R big Y big R big Y big R little Y big, big R little Y so half and half this one would be big R little Y big R little Y little R little Y little R little Y so those would be the gametes the possible genotypes would be round and yellow right because you can be this or you can be uh, you can end up with a round and green etc etc so you can work this all up it's easier to see this if you do it as a pundit square with with all of these possibilities the, the four different types of gametes on each side and you will end up with this so you'll notice that three quarters are round one quarter is wrinkled that we end up with one two three four of the 16 will be green and the rest will be 12 will be yellow so that we end up with this cross <coughs> <coughs> excuse me We'll end up with one green wrinkled, three yellow wrinkled, three green round, and the rest of them yellow round, which are the two dominants.
Okay, sometimes things are uh, not as simple. So this is called non-Mendelian inheritance. So everything that we talked about before is Mendelian. It's assuming pure dominance, pure recessive. That follow these probabilities. I see this video is getting a little bit long. I will do non-Mendelian inheritance in the next video. We'll stop this one and continue.